Good evening everyone. Uh, today we are going to discuss, to continue our discussion about comprehensive clinical nephrology. We started from the last video uh, about uh, uh, introduction to glomerular diseases. Uh, today we will continue part two. In, in part one we discuss clinical approach, clinical approach, presentation, clinical approach, history, examination, investigation and biopsy. Today we will discuss in details the different clinical presentations of glomerular nephritis or glomerular disease. As we describe in, the, in, in part one, that patient with glomerular diseases might present by different presentations. Asymptomatic urine abnormality either can present by macrohematuria, nephrotic, nephritic, RBGN, or uh, CKD. Today we are going to discuss each one of them in details. We will start by asymptomatic urinary abnormalities as a presentation of glomerulonephritis. The first presentation is if the patient is completely asymptomatic. This is very important. The patient had no symptom. Okay, but we detect during urine analysis that there is proteinuria or microhematuria. And usually this is the first evidence of glomerular diseases. To remember, to repeat, that the patient is completely asymptomatic. How we could find that? During, if if there is, if the patient is required to give urine analysis before uh, life insurance or joining armed forces or employment purposes and they detect that the patient has proteinuria or microhematuria. In some countries, like Japan, urine analysis is performed routinely in a school or employment, so they can detect these abnormalities or proteinuria or hematuria, and they can detect at a higher percentage IgA nephropathy that might present by microhematuria. But there is no evidence that we can do routine population-wide screening. يعني ما نقدرش نعمل ده ما يديناش الحق إن إحنا نعمل يورن نفس لكل الشعب. يعني إن هو ده عشان to detect a proteinuria or hematuria. يعني بنتكلم كcost benefit. آه لو حاجة تم ده بيبقى حاجة كويسة. يعني ده بيبقى very important. يعني حاجة تنفع to detect early the problems. طب ليه ليه ان ده يعني ككوست بنفيت ان ده ممكن ما يفرقش قوي لان البيشنت اف اسيمتوماتيك يوجوالي بروتينوريا والهيماتوريا فيري مايلد يوجوالي ذي ار فيري مايلد يعني انت الانترفنشن اللي احنا التريتمنت يوجوالي وي دونت جيف تريتمنت اور يوجوالي ذا رينا فانكشنز ار نورمال بس ده مش موجود ان اول كيسز ده ممكن يكون بقى امبورتنت امتى وي كان We should search for proteinuria or hematuria for high-risk population, like whom the most important for us is our diabetes or hypertension. They are the most common causes of CKD. We should search for albuminuria. Any patient with diabetes or hypertension, we should ask for albuminuria to detect early uh, renal affection. The first abnormality we could find in uh, uh, routine uh, or in urine analysis is asymptomatic hematuria. We could find hematuria in patient without any symptoms. Type. What is the definition of microhematuria? This is very important. الناس اللي بتمتحن بنسألهم الريزيدنت على طول أو يعني في أي إجزام. A definition of microhematuria: presence of more than Two RBCs per high power feed. Yep, I am to say in the microhematuria, if there is more than two RBCs. What are the most common causes? Not the only causes. The most common causes of microhematuria or asymptomatic hematuria, IgA nephropathy with thin basement membrane. Type. The first step when you find or you detect hematuria or microhematuria is to to define if it is glomerular or non-glomerular type. What are the factors that make us think that 
this hematuria might be glomerular. We should ask for dysmorphic RBCs in urine. We go to the lab and ask search for dysmorphic RBCs. If there is more than five percent of the RBCs are a cancer sites or dysmorphic, mostly it is glomerular. Or even we need a higher percentage. Or if this hematuria is accompanied by RBCs cast or proteinuria, then this hematuria usually it is glomerular. It is glomerular. If it is non-glomerular, like in neurological causes like stones, urothelial tumors, usually there is no proteinuria or no RBCs cost. And usually this uh, 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 hematuria usually results from small breaks in the glomerular basement membrane that will lead to extravasation of RBCs. How should I uh, approach to a patient presented by asymptomatic hematuria? Or if I find hematuria in urine analysis, what is how could I evaluate or approach? Approach as routine, we start by history. And the history is very, very important. We can reach our diagnosis from history. What should I ask the patient for? I should ask for if the, if the patient had uh, uh, heavy exercise before taking the urine analysis, heavy exercise. And one of the most important and most practical point, if the patient is female, is to exclude that she has menstruation. Menstruation, very common practice. And some patients come to us with urine analysis, RBCs, and they are afraid. دكتور بعتهم لا يورين أنالس فيه هيماتوريا وتخضوا بتاع طب يا جماعة نسأل مجرد إن إحنا نسأل لأن والله لا يا دكتور أنا كان في المنسز أو البيريد الهيستوري I should ask for sexual activity if the patient has trauma or viral illness دي حاجات very important I should ask for while evaluating هيماتوريا while evaluating الهيماتوريا this is very important. Type. I should ask for urine culture to exclude the UTI. I should ask, as I said before, the face contrast microscopy to search for dysmorphic RBCs. Our main, our main aim is to differentiate if this hematuria is glomerular or non-glomerular. I should search for if there is proteinuria. If there is proteinuria, usually it is glomerular. We should exclude urological causes urological causes should i ask for imaging our basic imaging modality is ultrasound abdomen and pelvis because many causes of urological cause stones tumors polycystic kidneys arteriovenous malformation in patient older than old and this is very very important remember that age patients older than 40 years old I should always, our main uh, concern is to exclude malignancy. Above 40 years of age, patient presented by hematuria, my main concern is to exclude malignancy. This is very, very important, especially if the patient is a smoker. If the patient is a smoker type. What increase my concern that it might be malignancy, especially if there is no proteinuria, especially if the RBCs are not dysmorphic and the patient is smoker, mostly I will ask for cystoscopy to exclude urethelial malignant disease. Okay, type. Patient younger than 40 years old, the concern is a little smaller. Okay. What about renal biopsy? Do we perform renal biopsy for each patient to present it to us with a microscopic hematuria? No. Mostly if the patient uh, had hematuria and the patient had normal blood pressure, normal kidney function, and proteinuria is less than 0.5 gram, mostly, mostly, 
we will not uh, perform a renal biopsy and we will do frequent follow-up frequent this is very important a follow-up is very crucial because if the patient if the blood pressure increase patient became hypertensive or the, if there is deterioration of kidney function or deterioration of proteinuria we will ask for and we will perform a renal biopsy because we cannot reach our final diagnosis without without a renal biopsy a renal biopsy is mandatory to confirm our diagnosis the second finding in urine analysis that we could find is proteinuria and the patient might be asymptomatic asymptomatic proteinuria the hallmark of glomerular disease is proteinuria proteinuria is mostly uh, caused by a glomerular disease normal proteinic secretion very important to know that number is less than 150 milligram per day very very important as i told my uh, i'm telling my students usually if you find proteinuria i should quantify whenever you find protein proteins in urine one plus two plus three plus i should quantify proteins okay. proteinuria is usually identified and quite by uh, through dipstick testing or urine collection okay. uh, normal albumin albumin excretion normal al albumin excretion in urine normally is less than 30 milligram per day you have a normal protein excretion 100 less than 150 milligram per day normal albumin excretion is less than 30 milligram per day type if the albumin excretion between 30 and uh, 300 milligram it is called previously called microalbuminuria now it is termed moderately increased albuminuria if it is more than 300 milligram it's called previously uh, uh, termed macroalbuminuria now it is termed severely increased albuminuria okay. this low level of increased albumin excretion between 30 and 300 milligram is usually not detected by normal dipstick if i found in urine analysis there is protein at least one plus by normal dipstick this is more than 300 uh, milligram per day how, how i could uh, detect this low level of albuminuria usually by special urine testing okay or by quantification quantification albumin to creatinine ratio or protein uh, or a 24 hour urine uh, collection proteinuria of more than 3.5 uh, gram per day it is termed nephrotic range proteinuria while proteinuria less than uh, 3.5 gram per day it's called non-nephrotic proteinuria uh, less than 3.5 gram uh, nephrotic range proteinuria is mostly caused by glomerular diseases while proteinuria less than that range might be caused by glomerular uh, proteinuria might be caused by abnormalities or disease affecting tubules of the kidney and might be caused by what is called overflow proteinuria overflow proteinuria we will discuss each one of them what is overflow proteinuria from its name it is due to an overflow of light chain it is due to of urinary light chain excretion it is seen mostly in multiple myeloma due to very huge amount of light chain excretion from uh, plasma cells increasing the capacity of the kidney of the glomeruli entering the tubules and causing what's called for example myeloma cast nephropathy type when i should suspect that the, uh, this uh, proteinuria is uh, overflow i should suspect and this is very important when the urinary dipstick is negative for albuminuria very very important clue in our clinical life and in exams if you find a patient with protein protein or proteinuria or heavy proteinuria protein for example 4 gram 5 gram 6 grams or 10 grams 10 grams 
and you ask for how I uh, how I find protein or either by 24 hour renal proteins or protein creatinine ratio for example is 10 gram and I ask for albuminuria albumin to creatinine ratio is 0.5 gram that's a proteinuria is 10 gram and albumin to creatine ratio is 0.5 gram or 1 gram what is the meaning of that this that this proteinuria is not mainly due to is not mainly composed of albumin it is due to other proteins not due to albumin most glomerular diseases are caused by albuminuria that meaning that most of the proteins in urine is composed of albumin and so we we can ask in our investigation for protein to creatine ratio or albumin to creatine ratio but but if you find that protein to creatine ratio or 24 hour protein is too heavy too large 10 grams 11 gram and the albumin to creatine is negative is negative or very small amount this means that this proteinuria is not due to albumin so what what are these proteins composed of mostly you should suspect of what's called paraproteinemias or light chain excretion and you should search for myeloma and other paraproteinemias this is very important in all exams either in md or in european specialty exam Second type of proteinuria might be it is due to due to tubular affection, renal tubules, affection tubular interstitial disease. And mostly it is of low range, less than two gram per day, usually associated with some uh, uh, albuminuria, but is also composed of tubular loss of tubular proteins like uh, alpha and beta two microglobulin usually it is of a bad prognostic sign bad prognostic sign ليه لان في الغالب بيقول لنا والله في احنا 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 بنتكلم على الجلومرولر افكشن لو جلومرولر نيفرايتس لقينا معاها ان في تيوبولر افكشن او تيوبولر بروتينز ده معناه ان في تيوبولر افكشن تيوبولر انترستيشال فايبروزس اند ذس از ا فيري باد بروجنوستيك ساين البروتينوريا دي ممكن تكون اللي هي النون نفراتيك بروتينز النون نفراتيك بروتينوريا دي مايت بي ايه ممكن تكون جلوميريولر وده الشائع مايت بي جلوميريولر والجلوميريولر بروتينز يعني هي بروتينوريا سببها مشكله فين في الجلوميريولاي احنا قلنا هنا بروتينوريا سببها اوفر فلو هنا بروتينوريا سببها مشكله في التوبيولز هنا البروتينوريا سببها فين مشكله في الجلوميريولاي ممكن تكون ثلاث انواع ممكن تكون حاجه ترانزيانت ترانزيانت حاجه مؤقته فانكشن ممكن تكون حاجه مهمه جدا اسمها اورثوستاتيك بروتينوريا اورثوستاتيك يعني ما تغير الوضع اور بيرزيستنت ودي اللي تبقى المهمه يعني حاجه فيكسد فيكسد بروتين ممكن تكون ترانزيانت فيكسد اور اورثوستاتيك Again, we are, we are now discussing glomerular proteinuria. The first one of them is functional, functional or transient proteinuria. Uh, in clinical scenario we are facing, mostly patient coming to us with a, a urine analysis, P protein 1 to 2 plus. That's what we do in our daily practice. على طول اللي كان بيكشف عند اي دكتور وشاف والله في بروتين 1 2 بلس طبعا رعبه جدا خوفه انت لازم تروح تشوف دكتور كلى وقصه طبعا المريض بيبقى جاي مروق اول حاجه ان احنا لازم نشوفها ان احنا لازم اكسكلود ذيس ترانزيانت كوزز لازم مش على طول مش اي مريض بروتينوريا ده على طول ده ده مشكله كبيره ده جلومينونيفرايتس ده والله مينيمالي تشينج ده فوكت ده من برينو بروليلا في ترانزيانت كوزز لازم اعمل ده اكسكلوجن وات ار Transient causes of proteinuria. Fever. You should ask the patient if he has fever. Exercise, heavy exercise. Modern gym or thermal walking or degree. And there's the heart failure. Very important. Increase the congestion for the kidney with proteinuria. Hyperadrenergic or hyperrenergic states. All of these can make us have low grade. Usually it is benign. low grade proteins 
usually it is due to increase intraglomerular pressure cause uh, intraglomerular pressure causing the some degree of proteinuria. Don't forget these transient causes of proteinuria. Not a, not every proteinuria is pathological. This might be due to transient, due to fever, exercise, and heart failure. The second type of proteinuria is orthostatic proteinuria. Very, very important in your clinical life and in exam. الناس اللي بتمتحن في الماجستير والدكتوراه وأي زمالة أو أي حاجة لازم على طول ده سؤال لا يخلو يعني موجود في كل الامتحانات. Orthostatic proteinuria. What does mean that this proteinuria is co it's caused by change in posture. To conclude, يعني عشان ننهي القصة دي معناها ايه دي بروتينوريا بتبقى موجودة مع تغير الوضع. دي ما بتبقاش بروتينوريا بتبقاش موجودة الصبح المريض بيكون نايم طول الليل يصحى الصبح ما فيش بروتينوريا. No protinuria in early morning. No protinuria in early morning. Because the patient is sleeping during night. But if I uh, take a urine sample in evening, evening, in evening at 4 p.m., 5 p.m., while the patient is walking after uh, doing his job, I found proteinol. So, and this is the clue to solve this problem or to reach your diagnosis. Proteinuria in the early morning is negative. If you took another sample at 4 or 5 p.m., you will find it positive. Like, what is the cause of that orthostatic proteinuria or that proteinuria that, that, uh, that happens with uh, uh, changing the posture? There is a recent hypothesis that when the patient in the upright position, renal plasma flow and GFR decrease. In those patients with orthostatic proteinuria, when the patient in the upright position and when the, this uh, GFR and GFR is decreased, the albumin is no longer excluded, excluded from filter. The albumin is not routinely excreted from the kidney or by the glomeruli by two mechanisms, by electrophoresis. Negative charge, negative charge of the glomerular basement membrane and negative charge of albumin. So the albumin is not excreted in urine. But in, the, in those patients, when the patient in the upright position, the GFR decreased, this electrophoresis or this negative charge that make a barrier to the passage of albumin is not is no longer efficient, making that some albumin is excreted in urine. This is the most recent hypothesis discussing the cause of orthostatic proteinuria. Right? How should I confirm my diagnosis that this proteinuria is orthostatic proteinuria? As I said, early morning is negative, 4 p.m. or 5 p.m. is positive, Usually it is less than one gram per day. There is no hematuria, no hypertension. Very important to complete your diagnosis. No hematuria, no hypertension, less than one gram per day. Patient a, a renal biopsy will reveal nothing. Normal morphology. You should assure your patient prognosis is good and renal biopsy is not indicated. You should assure your patient. طمن البيشنت بتاعك. مفيش مشاكل. متابعة كل فترات متباعدة عشان تطمن بس. إنما زي ما قلنا مفيش منها مشاكل أو ريسك. The third type of proteinuria is fixed proteinuria, which is our main entity of discussion. Fixed proteinuria. What is meant by fixed? It is not transient. If I repeat test for albuminuria or proteinuria after two to three weeks and I find it it is fixed or persistent. This is fixed proteinuria. It is mostly caused by glomerular disease. Mostly if this proteinuria, this proteinuria is more than one gram per day, 
mostly most of us will perform a renal biopsy especially if we gave ACE or ERBs and there is no response. This is an algorithm for approach to non-nephrotic proteinuria. Non-nephrotic range of proteinuria, asymptomatic type. What is the first uh, step? If you have, if you find proteinuria accidentally in urine analysis, as I said, you should quantify protein to creatine ratio, albumin to creatine ratio, 24-hour urinary proteins. You should quantify protein and measure LGFR. Measure LGFR. If you find that there is reduced GFR, I should search for the causes urgently. Serological test, ANO and anti-nuclear antibody, anti-double strand, C3, C4, hepatitis B surface antigen, hepatitis C virus antibodies, HIV antibodies, protein electrophoresis. I should search for the cause. And I should, of course, search for ultrasound and consider and prepare for renal biopsy. If you find that there is normal GFI, normal serum creatine, normal GFR, or non-nephrotic range of proteinuria, especially if less than one gram, less than one gram, I should ask for early morning proteins to exclude orthostatic proteinuria. If I find that it is negative in the early morning, so it is orthostatic proteinuria, what you will go to do? Nothing. Assure your patient. But if it is persistent or fixed, <clears throat> you should reassess. Reassess. Here you write, uh, they write that every uh, 6 to 12 months, I think it's a long period. Most of us in our clinical life will not wait uh, that long uh, period. We should repeat. We should repeat after 2 to 3 months. Repeat for the proteinuria and repeat in urine uh, protein, urinary protein, and GFR and blood pressure. If normal GFR and normal uh, blood pressure, I should reassess annually. If I found that the patient became hypertensive, or there is deterioration of GFR, or proteinuria increased to more than one gram, I should ask for serology, as I said, and ultrasound to prepare for renal biopsy. The third finding in urine analysis or in asymptomatic patients that I could find, we speak about asymptomatic hematuria and then we speak about asymptomatic proteinuria. But what if I found both proteinuria and hematuria in urine analysis? This is very critical. If I found both proteinuria and hematuria in the same patient, there is a much greater risk of significant glomerular injury. I shouldn't wait. I should ask for investigations urgently, especially if I found uh, uh, hypertension or deterioration of kidney function. And in most cases, we will ask for renal biopsy, even if there is a low level of proteinuria, 0.5 gram, because both of them is usually associated with significant glomerular injury. If we can wait if there is isolated hematuria or isolated proteinuria, we can wait somewhat, wait and reassess. But if there is both proteinuria and hematuria at the same time, usually there is significant glomerular affection and we should uh, uh, interfere urgently. Now we finish our first presentation, which is asymptomatic urinary abnormalities. Now we are going to discuss the second presentation of glomerular disease, which is macrohematuria. Macrohematuria. Macrohematuria, usually the patient is going to complaining of passing red urine. The patient will come to you saying that he has red urine or 
brownie or a smoky urine. Usually it is episodic, painless, episodic and painless in macrohematuria caused by glomerular disease. Because macrohematuria might be caused by glomerular and non-glomerular causes, mostly of urological origin. يبقى البيشنت هيجي يشتكي لك والله يجي يقول لك والله يا دكتور انا لون البول احمر او لون البول محمر على حسب كميه البلاد اللي موجوده فيه ممكن يكون لون البول احمر او سموكي يقول لك والله غامق كده او مدخن او شبه الكوكاكولا وبتبقى غالبا بدون الم تبقى بينلس وبو يقول لك ممكن يقول لك فيري كومن يقول لك الموضوع ده بيتكرر يقول لك والله كل فتره بيجي لي ان انا الاقي البول بتاعي كده بيحمر او وفي الغالب ان ما بيبقاش فيها كلوتس انا بتكلم على الجلوميرولار هيماتوريا جلوميرولار هيماتوريا يبقى الكرايتيريا اوف جلوميرولار هيماتوريا بينلس براوني اور سموكي اند يوزوالي ذير از نو كلوتس في الغالب ما بتبقاش برايت ريد بلاد برايت ريد بلاد The patient, you know, if it's bright red, mostly it is urological. The frank blood, that mostly is urological, mostly. Right. What is the differential diagnosis when patient coming to us or coming to you presented by red urine? What is your differential diagnosis? Very important. Differential diagnosis include hemoglobinuria, myoglobinuria, porphyrias. Some food dyes, LP root, and some drugs. The most important, the most common is rifampicin. You have a differential diagnosis with that: hemoglobinuria, myoglobinuria, the banger. You have to ask the patient. You know, one person can eat a lot of banger. Like that, mashaAllah, beautiful or beautiful. Right in the stomach. Of course, you know the banger is used in the stomach. So, it's very important. So, it's very important. So, it's very important. So, it's very important. So, it's طيب او يكون واخد ريفامبسين ولا حاجه يعني كان مثلا كونتاكت مثلا احنا عارفين ان بسين كونتاكت الحالي تي بي ولا حاجه وبياخد ريفامبسين او بياخد اي حاجه ثانيه وبعد كده اشتكى من ريديور طيب فده الديفرنشال دايجنوز هاو تو ديفرنشيت احنا هنتكلم يعني وي ار جوينج تو ديسكاس ات ليتر بس هاو تو ديفرنشيت بين اكشوال هيماتوريا اند هيموجلوبينوريا اند مايجلوبينوريا Very important. Type from urine analysis, hemoglobinuria, myoglobinuria, and the hematuria will test positive for blood by the best. Three of them will give positive blood by the best. If I take the last three, I will say for life, the blood positive. One plus two plus. Type. How to differentiate? You will differentiate by microscopy. Microscopy. حط تحت الميكروسكوب. If you found RBCs, so this is hematuria. If you don't found, if you don't find RBCs, so it might be hemoglobinuria or myoglobinuria. Then you look for microscopic examination. If you found RBCs positive, so it is hematuria. Negative or no RBCs, so it is hemoglobinuria or myoglobinuria. ريفيو الكلينيكال برزنتيشن هتعرف هيموجلوبينوريا غالبا هتلاقي معاه هيموليتيك انيميا مع جوندس مينلي ان دايركت هتلاقي القصه بتاعت هيموليتيك انيميا مايجلوبينوريا غالبا هتلاقي قصه واخد ستاتن او واحد عامل كراش انجري وماشي قصه المايجلوبين وطبعا في سبيشال تيست فور مايجلوبين والهيموجلوبين ده وفيري امبورتنت الجزء اللي انا حكيته ده الكلينيك هاو تو ديفرنشيت في الكلينيكال كيسز سيناريوز في الامتحانات الناس بتتحن زي ما انا بحاول اوضح القصه دي للناس لما يدخل الامتحان الاسئله المتوقعه في الماستر او في الام دي او في اي امتحان دي نقطه مهمه جدا في الكيس سيناريوز المختلف طيب ماكرو هيماتوريا اللي بتبقى كوزد باي جلوميرولار ديزيزز غالبا بتشاف في تشيندر ونينج ادلت وغالبا يعني ريرلي افتر الايج اوف 40 الموست مان اوف ذا موست كومن كوز از اي جي اي نفروبسي ذا موست كومن كوز اوف ماكرو هيماتوريا از اي جي اي نفروبسي 
But if you find the patient is complaining also of associated dull aching, lying pain with macrohematuria, our first differential diagnosis will be stones. Patient جايب دم في البول ومعاه loin pain أول حاجة تيجي في دماغك ستون أو حاجة تانية زي loin pain hematuria syndrome. Your main two differential diagnoses for macrohematuria, don't forget IgA nephropathy or recurrent, especially recurrent painless macrohematuria, your two main differential diagnoses, IgA nephropathy and post-infectious glomerulonephritis or post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. These are the two main Uh, uh, differential diagnosis for macrohematuria or recurrent attacks of hematuria. Both of them is episodic. Type how to differentiate very important, very, very important, very common questions. In IgA nephropathy, usually in hematuria to occur after one to three days after upper respiratory tract infection. Yep, uh, within one to two or one to three Days after upper respiratory tract infection, the attack of microhematuria happens. But in post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, usually the attack of hematuria happens after two to three weeks. If here one to three days, here within two to three weeks. Very important. Within two to three weeks after upper respiratory tract infection, the attack of hematuria occurs. Very, very important this point. Right. Of course, we should at any age while we are evaluating patient with macrohematuria, I should exclude urological causes. And cystoscopy might be needed, especially, especially if older than 40 years of age. When I suspect urological causes of hematuria, If the patient had no associated proteins, if the dysmorphic RBCs are uh, is a negative, I should suspect urological cause, or if there is associated loin pain. Yep, a urological hematuria is usually no associated proteins, negative dysmorphic, and uh, usually associated with pain. Usually, and sometimes it is usually associated with Frank blood uh, uh, hematuria, bright red hematuria. So we now finish asymptomatic and macrohematuria. Now we are going to discuss nephrotic syndrome. Definition of nephrotic syndrome is heavy proteinuria in adult more than 3.5 gram per day or in children more than 40 milligram per hour per square meter. This heavy proteinuria, never to forget that, each one of them will lead to the other. Heavy proteinuria will lead to hypoalbuminemia, albumin less than 3.5 gram, and this hypoalbuminemia will lead to decrease on contact pressure and osmotic pressure leading to edema, usually generalized edema, and usually associated with hypercholesterolemia and lipidurium previously known as the bentad of nephrotic syndrome, heavy proteinuria, hypoalbuminemia, edema, hypercholesterolemia, and lipidoria. What are the causes of nephrotic syndrome? The first one is minimal change. Second one, focal segmented, membranous. Membrane or proliferative. Dense deposit disease can present by nephrotic syndrome. Cryoglobulinemic MBGN might present by amyloidosis. Might present by nephrotic syndrome and diabetic nephropathy or diabetic kidney disease might present by nephrotic syndrome. Type. Each one of these We will going to discuss in details, but from now you can exclude what is the most important. Each one of them might be primary or secondary. 
primary, idiopathic, or secondary to these associations or to these diseases. And we sh you should know the secondary causes by heart. No excuse in your clinical life or in exams that you don't know this second because for each one of them because in our is very important especially in our clinical life by minimally change what are the most common the most important secondary causes atopy non-steroidal Hodgkin disease focal segmental african and usually it's a common presentation african americans hiv heroin and pamidronate obesity Vasoconstrictive reflux, membranous, very important, with gold and penicillamine chelating therapies, hepatitis B and hepatitis C, malaria, lupus, class five lupus, malignancy, never to forget that, malignancy especially with solid organ, breast, lung or GIT, membranoproliferative, type one, the most important association, especially. In Egypt is hepatitis C, density positive disease, usually it's with C3 nephritic factor, cryoglobulinemic with hepatitis C, amyloidosis, usually as an amyloidosis primary or secondary amyloidosis, or it might be associated also with myeloma, secondary amyloidosis with long term inflammatory conditions or long term infections, rheumatoid arthritis, bronchiectasis, Crohn's disease and familial Mediterranean fever, and of course with diabetes. What are the tests that I should ask for? What are the investigation from the causes you can ask for the investigation? HIV, I should ask for HIV. Heroin and bamidrin from history. Of course, from history. Hepatitis B surface antigen, hepatitis C virus antibodies, for lupus ano anti double strand, antiphospholipase A2 receptor, to differentiate between primary and secondary density in uh, type 1 in BGN usually there is decreased or consumption of both complement 3 complement 4 density positive disease very important that only complement 3 will be consumed and C4 will be normal in cryoglobulin usually the affection is mainly in C4 it will be consumed and positive rheumatoid factor very important clue and in myeloma, I will ask for bone marrow aspiration and protein electrophoresis and free light chains, as we are going to describe later. And diabetes, I will ask, of course, for fasting blood glucose and 22 hour postprandial blood glucose and hemoglobin A1C to diagnose and to follow up of our patients. Hypoalbuminemia is usually due to increased urinary loss due to heavy proteinuria. This will lead to response by the liver to increase the albumin synthesis and increase proteins from the liver. This hypoalbuminemia will lead to finally to what is called in some patient Merck's line. Merck's line present as white band in the nail. White band, very important in that name wide band in the nails in patients with hypoalbuminemia, it's called Merck line. The increase in protein synthesis by the liver in response to these proteinuria, it will increase all proteins. But what will happen? Large proteins, large molecular weight proteins will not be lost in urine and they will increase in plasma. While smaller proteins, small low molecular weight proteins, will pass in urine and decrease also in plasma, despite the increase in sense, but they will be lost. These variations it will lead to increase some proteins, large proteins in plasma, and the loss of smaller proteins in urine. This will lead to, and as we're going to discuss later play a role in hypercoagulability and the hyperlipidemia associated with nephropathy. Edema. We have two theories uh, uh, to, uh, to describe edema in patients with nephrotic syndrome. We have underfill theory and overfill theory. Underfill theory, it is the classical uh, theory 
from all times that proteinuria led to hypoalbuminemia and hypoalbuminemia will lead to decreased oncotic pressure leading to decreased intravascular blood volume decreased oncotic pressure inside the blood vessel will lead to extravasation of blood in the extravascular space with decreased intravascular volume blood volume this will lead to with the depletion of the intravascular volume will lead to the uh, body will react by increasing vasopressin vasopressin will lead to LADH antidiuretic hormone from its name antidiuretic will lead to water retention water retention to do was to compensate for the decreased intravascular volume what is the second response atrial natriuretic peptide from its name it is released from atrium from the atrium natri sodium uretic in urine so it is a molecule that is released from the atrium to increase sodium loss in urine so it increased in what condition in high barvolemia or volume overload when the intravascular volume increased and increase in uh, increase the in intravascular volume will increase the blood volume inside also inside inside the heart compressing or stretching the atrium it will release this this stretch to the atrium will release this peptide atrial natriuretic peptide causing what causing the kidney to increase sodium to be lost in urine when the sodium is lost in urine it will take water with it so decrease the blood volume so this peptide is released in hypervolemic status to decrease to increase sodium and water loss so in this condition we have decreased intravascular volume so there is no stretch to the atrium so there is no release of atrial natriuretic peptide so the atrial natriuretic peptide level will be normal or low the third response to decreased intravascular volume is activation of the RAS system renin angiotensin system will lead to increase in aldosterone what is the mechanism of aldosterone what is the function of aldosterone never to forget that aldosterone function is reabsorption of sodium and the excretion of potassium and the hydrogen reabsorption of sodium so it will reabsorb back sodium in cases of hypovolemia to get the sodium back inside the body with water to increase the volume and it will excrete and exchange potassium and hydrogen so increase aldosterone will lead to sodium retention increase vasopressin will lead to water retention and sodium and aldosterone increase will lead to sodium retention and both of them with the water retention inside the body and sodium retention inside the body will lead to edema this is underfill theory while the overfill theory which is a much more common mechanism for edema in most nephrotic patients is due to usually a defect in the tubules is usually due to a defect in the distal convoluted tubule defect in excreting sodium that will lead to sodium retention so there is a defect in the distal convoluted tubules to excrete sodium this will lead to sodium retention usually lead to activation of the epithelial sodium channel usually due to activation of the epithelial sodium channels so, so the sodium retention will increase the plasma volume it is the opposite underfill theory states that there is reduced plasma volume while the overfill there is increased plasma volume like as we described before if there is increased the plasma volume this will lead to the vasopressin response will be 
no, not increased. At least it will be not increased because there is increased plasma volume. And there is increased plasma volume stretching the atrium. So it will release atrial natriuretic peptide as a response, causing sodium natriuresis to decrease the plasma volume. Also, as a response of sodium retention already, I have sodium, increased sodium retention in our body. So, of course, the aldosterone will decrease because the mechanism of sodium or the function of sodium is sodium reabsorption. So, if there is sodium retention, of course, I don't need to do sodium reabsorption. So, the aldosterone will decrease. And this sodium retention will lead to sodium retention will lead to edema. So, these or the underfill theory, the description or the analysis of the underfill theory and the much more common overfill theory in nephrotic syndrome. There is a hypercoagulable state in nephrotic syndrome and the, cause, uh, the different causes for this hypercoagulability is there is increase in the proteins of the coagulation ca cascade Increase in the coagulant proteins and decrease in the anticoagulant proteins. Also, platelet aggregation is enhanced. Also, the cybercoagulable state is much more affected by immobility, associated infections, and hemoconcentration. And this thrombosis is not only in the venous system, but also in can happen in arterial system. Usually. 10%, 10% of adult, of nephrotic adult, and 2% of nephrotic children will have thromb thromboembolism. And this risk, 10%, 2%, is much more higher, higher in membranous. Never to forget that. The most common GN to be associated with thrombosis is membranous. Measuring coagulation proteins is not helpful, and the most one, the most important one, or uh, we can use it, or we actually use it in our clinical life as a surrogate marker for thromboembolism is serum albumin. Thromboembolic events are much more common if the serum albumin is less than two gram per deciliter. Very important, and usually we give the patient and prophylactic anticoagulation if the albumin is less than 2 or even 2.5 gram per deciliter. Renal vein thrombosis is a very important, very important and very critical complications that can happen when in patients with nephrotic syndrome. It usually it, it happens in up to 8% and the frequency increase in 10 to 50% of our patients. When to suspect, when to suspect, uh, renal vein thrombosis in a nephrotic patient if the patient begin to complain of flank pain and hematuria. Never to forget that a red flag in a nephrotic patient is also a very common clinical scenario in, in clinical life and also as an exam question. Patient, nephrotic patient began to complain of flank pain and hematuria and even deterioration of proteins or proteinuria, your first concern is to exclude renal vein thrombosis by asking for usually doubler for the renal vessels. And also pulmonary embolism is an important complication. What are the mechanisms of hypercoagulable states as we described? There is increased hepatic synthesis as a feedback or as a response to proteinuria or uh, hypoalbuminemia will increase protein synthesis. There is increase in coagulation proteins like in fiber, like fibrinogen, von Willebrand factors, and there is decreased of some anticoagulant proteins like antithrombin 3 is lost, lost in urine. As we described before, the proteins of low molecular weight will be lost in urine. One of, uh, of these examples is antithrombin-3. So there is increase of some coagulant proteins and there is 
uh, increase the urinary clearance of some of them. There is also increased platelet aggregation. There is also hemoconcentration and immobility. And all of these will lead to arterial and venous thromboembolism. Hyperlipidemia and lipidemia. Very common uh, uh, associations in patient with nephrotic syndrome. And we should, it is a must to ask for cholesterol and triglyceride in any patient presented to you with nephrotic range of proteinuria. It is a must. You should ask for uh, cholesterol and triglyceride. And the, mostly uh, the patient will have hypercholesterolemia. Hypercholesterolemia. And, and it reaches a very high levels, even more than 500 milligram uh, per deciliter. Some patients usually from these high levels of cholesterol uh, usually have xanthelasmus. The affection of that hypercholesterolemia on the heart cardiac condition is difficult to prove, but usually we give, uh, but now it's accepted that patients with nephrotic syndrome have a five-fold increase in coronary health from that uh, hypercholesterolemia. And usually the cause of that hyperlipidemia or hypercholesterolemia is increased the hepatic senses of LDL, low density lipoproteins, and VLDL, which are the bad forms of cholesterol, LDL and VLDL, and decreased HDL, which is the good form of LDL. There is defective also lipoprotein lipase activity resulting in increased VLDL. Lipoprotein lipase is needed to degrade. LVLDL هو ده اللي بيكسر LVLDL very low density lipoprotein لما ده ما يكسروش وبالتالي هيزيد الليبيدوريا والليزرد فروم ذا انكريزد ليبيد اند يوجوالي بريزنت از اوفر فات بوتيز اور فاتي كوست فاتي كوست ان يورين سو ذير از وات ار ذا كوز اوف هايبر ليبيديم انكريزد هيباتيك سينثيسيس As a, as a result of or as a response of heavy proteinuria, increase the bad cholesterol VLDL, we increase the LDL. These are bad cholesterol, special oxidized LDL. They both will precipitate in tissues. They are bad cholesterol. They will precipitate in tissues. HDL. The function of HDL is to remove the cholesterol from tissues and bring it back. This bring it. That cholesterol to the liver, so it is a good cholesterol, and this this HDL HDL is decreased in nephrotic syndrome. Why? Because it is excreted in urine. There is also increase of lipoprotein small a is increased, which is also an atherogenic compound. What are the metabolic effects of nephrotic syndrome? Vitamin D binding protein is lost in urine, leading to low plasma level of 25 hydroxy vitamin D. But the plasma free, the free vitamin D, which is the most important, is usually normal. And overt osteomalacia and uncontrolled hyperparathyroidism is unusual. If a vitamin D binding protein is lost, low plasma level of 25 hydroxy vitamin D, but the plasma free vitamin D is normal, and the clinical implication of that is usually unusual. Next, the claim on thyroid binding globulin, also be lost in urine, with total circulating thyroxin total is reduced. ولكن عشان كده احنا لما بنطلب بنطلب الفري الفري ثايروكسين والتي اس اتش ار يوجوالي نورمال يوجوالي ذير از نو كلينيكال افكشن في الثايرويد ستيتس الدراج بايندنج مهم جدا ان احنا نخلي بالنا منه لان احنا عندنا هايبو البومينيميا للدراجز اللي هي بتبقى بروتين باوند دراجز تمام فده مهم في بعض الدراجز بنحتاج ان احنا طبعا نظبط الدوز بتاعتها زي الوارفرين 
والدايراتكس نخلي بالنا ان البيشنت بتاعنا بيبقوا ادونتس الانفكشن از فيري كومن فيري كومن كومبليكيشن اوف نيفروتيك بيشنتس والسبسس كان الموست كومن كوز اوف ديث في الشيلدرن اللي عندهم نيفروتيك كان البرايمري بريتونايتس فيري كومن في الشيلدرن دول ولكن مع تقدم العمر بيقل الانفكشن ده شويه طيب ايه الكومن انفكشنز وات ار ذا سايتس اللي احنا بنشوفها اكشوالي في اور كلينيكال لايف مع حالات النفروتيك طبعا اشهر حاجه السيلولايتس وخصوصا في الاريز اوف سيفير ايديما وانا قلت لكم تتذكر المره اللي فاتت في اللور لم نخلي بالنا على تستيكولر ايديما وساعات بنحصل عليها انفكشن لا قدر الله او فورني جانجرين في حالات بتبقى فيري سيفي ايه الـ explanations why what are the causes of increased infection or a nephrotic patient are more susceptible to infections ان هما الـ large fluid collection دي are sites for bacteria to grasp nephrotic skin بيكون fragile من خلاله يدخل ده الـ organism الـ edema ممكن can dilute the humoral immunity loss of immunoglobulin G and the complement factor B في الـ urine الزنك والترانسفيرين are lost in urine both of them are needed for lymphocyte function neutrophilic phagocytic function is usually is also impaired طيب ايه اللي كمان اللي ممكن يحصل مع النفروتيك ممكن يحصل لنا AKI حاجة very very important usually in patient with nephrotic syndrome usually have as we classic teaching usually have No renal impairment or mild renal impairment. But can patient with nephrotic syndrome suffer from AKI? Yes. So what are the causes of AKI? That's so all. We ask all our tools, our residents, and the patients. We see it. We can see it. The most important cause for AKI in patient with nephrotic is dehydration or بري رينا افكشن غالبا بيبقى ايه السيناريو بيشنت ده نفروتيك بيشنت اديماتس هايبو البومينيميك اند وي جيف هيم هاي دوز اوف دايوريتيك والبيشنت هافينج ديبليتد انترافاسكولار فوليوم وذ هاي فوليوم وذ هاي دوز اوف دايوريتيك يو ويل ديبليتد مور كوزنج بري رينا افكشن اند كرياتينين ويل بي انكريز ده ال very common scenario عشان كده بيبقى احنا ال practice بتاعنا ب... واحنا بن treat ال edema القصة دي بنعمل ايه؟ albumin infusion albumin transfusion to bring back the fluid from the extravascular space to the intravascular space and then we give diuretic albumin with diuretic if you give diuretics when patient was severely hypoalbuminemic When intravascular volume is depleted, you will lead to renal and dehydration and AKI. Another source or another cause of AKI is sepsis. Very common. We'll see what happens. We'll see what are the causes of increased infection. Transformation of disease itself. In the patient, might be complicated by crescentic nephritis. In the patient, for example, can be membranous or has also crescentic nephritis to more severe histological form. Another cause for AKI, renal vein thrombosis from the hypercoagulable state. Another cause is nephrotoxic drugs, non-steroidal, LAs with ARBs, very common drugs. Usually we prescribe them for nephrotic range proteinuria and we prescribe AS or ARBs. If you give it in a higher dose, a higher dose, what is the mechanism of uh, AS or ARBs? Efferent. Arteriolar vasodilatation. If I make the efferent vasodilated, it will happen with AKI that uh, with ACE or ARBs because their mechanism they will decrease in intraglomerular pressure because they cause efferent vasodilatation. لما يعملوا dilatation, the blood will add up in speed. That's what they do. They do their job. They do their job. How the ACE or the ARBs they decrease the proteinuria. I am decreasing the intraglomerular pressure. فبفتح الافرنت causing افرنت dilatation so blood the pressure will decrease inside the glomeruli 
so it will decrease proteinuria but it also will decrease the filtration it will decrease the glomerular filtration rate so normally with ACE or ARBs there is decrease with GFR but it is accepted up to 20 to 30 percent decrease if it is more than that we should decrease the dose of ACE or ARBs or stop it. Right. The risk of CKD with nephrotic syndrome is very minimal with minimal change, very minimal, but with other causes of a nephrotic syndrome, of course, there is a risk of CKD especially if with high grade proteinuria and if there is associated hypertension and impaired uh, uh, kidney function because this proteinuria is usually toxic to the tubules and interstitia we finish nephrotic syndrome we are reaching our uh, last part of our uh, topic today we will talk now about nephrotic uh, syndrome. While nephrotic syndrome is mainly due to problem in the permeability of the glomerular basement membrane, in nephritic is usually due to glomerular inflammation. Glomerular inflammation that will lead to decrease PGFR, proteinuria, usually non nephrotic, of course, some edema and hypertension or hematuria or RBC is caused. You have a nephritic syndrome via hematuria, RBC is caused, decreased GFR, hypertension, and you get salt and water retention, salt retention, proteinuria and edema, and proteinuria or edema is less severe than a nephrotic syndrome. The classic presentation for nephritic syndrome is acute post streptococcal. This is the classic, not the only cause, of course. Usually, children present rapid onset of oliguria with gain from edema, hematuria, resulting in a brown, brown urine. There is RBC's cost. Album excretion is usually minimal. El volume, blood volume, Increased and causing hypertension, and some patients suffer from pulmonary edema from that salt retention. What are the common causes of our uh, common causes of uh, nephritic uh, presentation or nephritic syndrome? Post infectious, post infectious, or IgA and lupus. Post infectious, the most important is post streptococcal, as we described usually presented the usual clinical presentation is hematuria after two to three weeks of upper respiratory tract infection or skin infection infective endocarditis abscess chant nephritis chant for hydrocephalus usually post infectious glomerular nephritis usually have consumed c3 and c4 we can ask for post streptococcal for anti streptomycin or tetra. And to diagnose other infections, we can ask for blood cultures. IgA nephropathy is usually presented by hematuria within one to two, uh, two, two or three days after upper respiratory tract infections with recurrent attacks of macroscopic or microscopic hematuria. There is increase in serum IgA in about 50% of patients. Lupus nephritis, of course, there is positive anti-nuclear antibody, anti-double strand, and consumed C3 and C4. To summarize between nephrotic or to differentiate between nephrotic and nephritic, usually the presentation nephritic is much more sudden, edema more severe in nephrotic, blood pressure and the volume is more increased, increased blood volume in nephritic, condition nephritic syndrome proteinuria more severe and nephrotic hematuria or RBC's caused with nephritic and of course hypoalbuminemia with nephrotic
The next presentation is RBGM, Rapidly Progressive Gromelionephritis. Type Rapidly Progressive Gromelionephritis, from its name, there is rapid and progressive in kidney function. في الغالب السيناريو بيكون patient presented by creatinine 2 after 2 days 4 creatinine 6 8 very rapid increase in serum creatinine or very rapid deterioration in GFR in in few days this is what the prescription of rapidly progressive glomerulonephritis this is the presentation it is an emergency and patient might need hemodialysis Patient usually need very rapid intervention. Very rapid intervention. And usually, glomerular tuft shows segmental necrosis or necrotizing glomerulonephritis. This is very common. And usually, there is crescent, crescent in the Bowman's space. Affecting the filtration, glomerular filtration, is causing oliguria and very rapid decrease in kidney function. The most common causes of RBGN is good vascular syndrome, vasculitis, immune complex diseases, good vascular syndrome is usually there is associated lung hemorrhage diagnosed by anti-GBM antibodies. Vasculitis, we are going to describe it later. Wagner uh, vasculitis, large vessel vasculitis, medium vessel or small vessel vasculitis. We uh, might be small vessel vasculitis, pussy immune or immune complex mediated. Uh, Wagner granulomatosis and the recent name is granulomatosis with polyangitis or the eosinophilic granulomatosis uh, with polyangitis, uh, the church of Strauss, or a microscopic polyangitis, the Wagner C. anca, the microscopic B. anca, the pussy immune or renal limited vasculitis, usually associated with B. anca. The immune complex diseases that might present by RBGN, the most important is lupus, especially class 3 and class 4. Post streptococcal is not not all times benign, but might present by RBGN if associated with crescentic, uh, many crescent. Also, the same is IgA nephropathy. It is not always benign, but in very few patients might present by RBGN. Endocarditis, the same condition. The last one is progressive CKD. The last presentation for patient with glomerulonephritis to be presented with that this patient might present with CKD. The patient might uh, enter, uh, might pass the first phase of the disease without asking medical help or not diagnosed or not asking for a medical help. ما راحش سأل ولا عدى الموضوع كان عنده بسيط أو الدكتور مش القصوش أو أي سبب من الأسباب ودخل في كرونيك chronic GN وصل لي slow progressive renal deterioration we وصل ان the patient presented uh, غالبا جاي لك بكرياتنين 2 uh, او 3 هتعمل له urine analysis هتلاقي فيه proteins sometimes you find hematuria غالبا proteins بنتكلم من 1 to 2 gram ولا حاجة usually we present by manifestations of CKD hypertension some proteinuria and renal impairment. An ultrasound, very important, smooth and symmetrical, and shrink, small, small kidneys, but smooth and symmetrical, very important. The kidney of chronic GN is a small, but a smooth and symmetrical. Decision of renal biopsy, the controversy. يعني بعض البيشنت بنعمل ممكن نعمل بيوبسي ده على حسب وضع الكيدني في الالترا ساوند if it is showing signs of coronacity sometimes we don't perform a biopsy for fear of uh, complications of renal biopsy but if the condition is ال ال features of chronicity في الالترا ساوند is not obvious قوي يعني مش واضحه جدا او كده فممكن نعمل عشان to reach ال diagnosis 
ده هتقولي ده مهم في ايه مهم if you are planning to transplant عاوز اعرف ال primary disease ايه عشان ال recurrence لو حاجة بتحتاج recurrence هتعمل recurrence ولا حاجة ماشي طبعا هنلاقي في الغالب ان في جلوميرولوس كلوروزس و افتا انترستيشال فايبروز و تيوبلر اتروفي يعني ممكن الميون فلوريسنس يساعدنا عشان نوصل للبرايمري دايجنوستس ثانك يو فور يور ليسننج وي فينيش كلينيكال برزنتيشنز فور ديفرنت جلوميرولر فور ذا جلوميرولو نيفرايتس ان شاء الله ذير از ثيرد بارت that we will discuss in details the management, the general management for different glomerulonephritis for as a whole and uh, after that we will discuss each uh, cause of glomerulonephritis we will discuss uh, start by minimal change, minimal mass focal segmental uh, but the next part there is uh, part 3 about the introduction we will talk about treatment and general management for different glomerular diseases Thank you. Thank you.